Miracle Man by Thomas Medina. In a deep, dark cave, which had until recently never been touched by any human, a worn, feeble man sat on a magnificent golden throne. Slouched forward unconsciously, Dimitri's head bobbed gently as his desperate dreams tormented him. Uncomfortable beads of sweat rolled from his mess of thinning grey hair and into the overgrown mat of unkempt beard on his face, eventually pattering onto the golden throne below. Around the extravagant seat, other objects of expensive gold were given away by a soft golden glow reflected from a tiny sliver of light from somewhere far above. And all was quiet. A man dying alone in a dark cave. That's how it was one moment. Then, hardly a second later, it all changed, as before the throne appeared a young man holding a bright lamp, who shouted jovially, And then there was light! (gasps) Dimitri woke with a jolt, hands jerking up to shield his eyes from the light. Ahoy, me lord! Thought you might like to be able to actually see your little kingdom. I'll just put this over here, shall I? The newcomer placed the lamp beside the throne and his hands on his hips. Dimitri squinted up at him. Aidan had carefully combed dark hair and wore a bright white shirt, brilliant red suspenders and a mischievous smile. How long has it been? 73 seconds, give or take. No, how long has it been for you? Aidan blinked and thought for a moment. About 20 years. Dimitri examined Aidan thoughtfully. With the new lamp, this was the first time he'd been able to look at the young man clearly. If you're so old, why do you look like that? Well, it's not my fault. You're the one seeing me. You you know, you could really do with some ceiling decoration. Aidan pranced across the small cave, waving his arms theatrically. I mean, I love this style you've got going. Plain, cavernous rock, bold design. I think I've seen a chandelier here in the 20th century that would really work well in here. What do you think, conductor of the cavern? Shall I bring you a chandelier? Or something more fun, maybe some bongos, or a lute. There once was a lute, they called it an oot. Somehow the pauper got it stuffed down his boot. Oot, shoot, there's an oot in my foot. The pauper's wife hooted and tooted, then muted, because she realised the loot booty actually suited. <laughs> That's true, you know. With effort, Dimitri sat up in his throne and watched Aidan carefully. Did you forget about me? I don't forget anything. I'm cursed that way. Remember, I'm not human. You seem pretty human to me. Oh, cheers. Where have you been? Oh, all over. It's not just you, you know. Plenty of people to help out there. That pauper literally had a loot in his boot. Everyone's got problems. At least most of them don't go and get themselves stuck in some cave like this. I mean, you're impressively lost. Impressively far down and lost. I doubt anyone else will be down here for a few hundred years. Certainly not on purpose. Congratulations! This is certainly a bang-up flagrant display of your own mortality. Aidan bent down and picked up one of the many golden trinkets on the floor. He twirled it through his fingers as he paced the room. Although there was this woman recently, or a long time ago, one of those. Nice lady, blind, kept getting herself hit by cars. I mean, all the time, like you wouldn't believe. (laughs) She was hit by a car on 12 separate occasions. Died from nine of those. I couldn't come along and save her every time. (laughs) That would be ridiculous. No, what I did is I put this simple chemical compound in her laundry detergent. Basically made her clothing brightly coloured. Cool fashion statement. Highly visible. No more car accidents. Another win for me. When are you going to get me out of here? The trinket slipped from Aiden's fingers. He fumbled to catch it, but it clattered to the ground. He examined his hands gingerly. I thought I made it clear that I'm not going to be saving you, Dimitri Forrester. (laughs) If you've got all these powers... What's wrong with dying? Eh? Everybody dies. You've lived a good life, Dimitri. A full life. That's not fair! Dimitri rose from his seat, forcing energy back into his weak limbs. Aidan blinked uncomfortably, stepping back, avoiding eye contact. Dimitri was over a head taller than him. You know, you people, you put a lot of weight into the way things end. 
The ending doesn't ruin the rest. If death is so fine, why do you always look away from me when you talk about it? I do not! You're doing it right now! Oh, time I was going. How long have I been in here? Four minutes? Oh, why do you keep leaving? Aidan looked right into Dimitri's face, his sense of humour now entirely absent. See you soon, Dimitri. And he vanished instantaneously. Bah! Dimitri spat in frustration. The lamp flickered and dimmed slightly. For a long moment, Dimitri stared into the empty space Aidan had inhabited. Then, again drained of energy, he melted back down into his ephemeral throne. His mind was surely playing tricks on him, his dehydration summoning this dastardly vision. This trickster, who boasted of incredible powers yet refused to save him from his cave? How many times now had the angel visited? Ten? More? And was he even an angel? Dimitri thought he'd seen wings before, but he couldn't remember clearly. He slowly ran his palm across the side of the throne the apparition had brought hours earlier. It was intricately patterned. It felt real. Was he imagining this, too? This couldn't be the end. He could still find his own way out. Discovering some new hidden reserve of energy, Dimitri sat up and looked around. The walls of the cave were visible now, thanks to the lamp, and he could see how jagged and bumpy the stone was. Enough to climb? Dimitri stood and made for the wall. He took three steps before his right leg gave way. Ah! He crumpled to the ground in pain and held his shin. It felt silky smooth. He looked down to find his hands covered in blood. When had he cut his knee? Yet another reason not to trust his own memory. Working carefully so as to conserve his strength, Dimitri tore a strip off his ragged shirt and used it to bandage his bloody wound. Then he slowly rose again, gently applying a little weight to his right leg. It ached fiercely, but it held. Clenching his teeth and trying to ignore the darkening of his vision and the ringing in his ears, Dimitri limped the rest of the way to the side of the cavern. There he leaned and examined the rocky protrusions. They seemed large and sturdy enough to hold at least some of his weight. He looked up. The wall continued in a similar pattern for a few metres. After that, he couldn't tell. It was too dark. In a flurry of agony, Dimitri hobbled to the lamp, grabbed it, and brought it back to the wall where he leaned again with relief. He glanced down at the lamp. It appeared to be dimmer than a moment ago. He examined the stand. It was of a simple, elegant design. A power cable protruded from the globe at the top and twisted its way down the length of the polished silver pole, ending in a basic pronged power plug, which wasn't plugged into anything. Dimitri bent down and picked it up. I'm imagining things. What things? Dimitri spun around. There he was again, that odd young man. He looked different. A demon who wants nothing but to torment me as I die. A demon? Ooh, where? I'm quite good with demons. Dimitri's gaze was pointed. Oh, me. Dimitri dropped the impossible power cord and turned back to the wall of the cave. I'll try not to be too insulted, shall I? Look, I brought you these glasses. I thought you might like to see some future tech. You should try them on. Aiden held up a slick pair of glasses with complex digital lights flashing on the lenses. Dimitri ignored him, reaching up to shakily clasp several handholds before raising one leg onto a low foothold. Ooh, that, um, that doesn't seem like the smartest thing to be doing, Dimitri. I'm... I'm... getting... out. Dimitri grunted as he climbed the cavern wall, quite quickly for a man of his age and exhaustion. Aiden sighed and put the glasses down on the throne. If you fall, I can't catch you. Because you're not real! No, because I can't touch anything anymore. Well, some things, but it's it's becoming harder. I'm fading away. Perhaps you're right, perhaps I'm not real. Dimitri felt around for another handhold. I haven't been completely honest with you, Dimitri. Some of the things I've told you may have given you the wrong impression about me. What? 
Now you're going to tell me you didn't really perform all those miracles you've gone on and on about? Saving a blind woman a dozen times or whatever it was? No, no, that was true. I did. Her name was Eloise Russell. She would have died nine times if not for my interference. The problem was the tenth time. Dimitri heaved himself higher. He was now five metres above Aiden. Well, she got new clothes, didn't she? So, of course, I go to change her laundry detergent again. And I can't. It stings me when I touch it. Well, why not just talk to her? Tell her to be more careful on the roads. I try that. Of course I try that. But she's like you. She's stubborn. You know, people used to listen to me, to do what I told them. It was easy to guide them, but uh, I no longer dazzle them. And they're remarkably cautious. Dimitri's foot slipped on a curved rock. He nearly fell, but his sweaty arms held him up, muscles bursting with effort. Uh, do be careful. Why? You're saying I'm going to die anyway? That fall won't kill you. It'll just hurt. A lot. Dimitri cranked his neck to glare angrily down at Aiden. Oh, can you not just tell someone? Tell someone where I am and they can come find me. There's no one. I've looked, Dimitri. There's no one who can. There's no way they can come get to you down here, even if they'd listen to me. Oh, why don't you just go back and... Dimitri lost his grip. He slid violently down the side of the cave with a loud, echoing scrape. No! Dimitri crumpled into the ground with a violent breaking of bones. Aiden looked on in horror, pacing on the spot. Ah! Dimitri, you imbecile! Are you still alive? (sighs) Dimitri moaned weakly and slowly rolled over. Half his face was bloody and bruised. His limbs were a mess. Aiden couldn't stand to look at him. He raised his fist to his forehead in frustration and shook his head. I've got to go. I won't be long. Two minutes. I'll be back in two minutes. Aiden blinked and the cave was replaced by his office. Warm light filled his eyes as he took in his grand home. Large bookshelves lined the walls. Various objects from different time periods lay neatly on small tables by the windows where the blinds were closed, but a soft, ethereal light seeped through. Everything was exceptionally neat. Aidan walked to the antiquated desk at the centre of the room and sank heavily into his leather chair. With a sigh, he leaned right back and looked up at the ceiling, trying not to see Dimitri's broken body in his mind's eye. He gazed down at his desk... It was clear, but for a lamp, an old radio, and a document about Dimitri Forrester. And was that a speck of dust? He quickly swatted it away. Aidan had visited Dimitri 17 times over the past thousand years. Each time he left hoping he'd find a new way to save, or at least help Dimitri in some way. But he never did. And now, doubted he ever would, Aidan seemed to just keep growing weaker. As did Dimitri, who probably only had a few more minutes to live. So Aidan would only have to visit one more time. Relieved by that realisation, he scooped up the document about Dimitri and opened a desk drawer. He was about to put it into the drawer when he changed his mind. Why not get those few minutes over with now? Now, while he could at least try to do some good, before he lost all his powers completely... With new purpose, he slammed the document onto the desk and stood up, teleporting to a castle in the 20th century. Nothing happened. Aidan froze. He was still in his office. He frowned and tried again, clenching his fists. This time, it worked, his surroundings immediately becoming those of the intended destination. He was in an extravagant hall, and above him was a brilliant chandelier. Aidan wandered across the hall and up a staircase, round the hallway and up another flight of stairs, and he was by the balcony. He looked down and enjoyed the view of the building's magnificent interior. He loved places like this. Sometimes he would spend days just admiring a building he liked. He let his vision run appreciatively across the polished bronze cornice. Then he froze. There was someone down below, in the corner of his eye, a young German soldier staring up at him. Aidan pulled a serious expression, as if critiquing the hall, then looked down straight at the soldier and nodded curtly. 
The young German nodded back awkwardly, then scurried away to get help. Aidan dropped the facade, wondering what he must have looked like to the soldier. Must have been pretty conspicuous. Oh well, he'd just have to be quick. Aidan took a deep breath as he stepped back from the edge of the balcony. Severe shouts began to echo through the castle below. He turned and locked his gaze onto his target and began to run. He sprinted to the balcony's edge, leapt onto the railing and dived with all of his momentum towards the chandelier. He raised his arms and braced himself for impact. But it didn't come. He flew through the chandelier, not touching it at all. Horrified, he twisted in the air and reached out to grab it before he fell too far away. He held his breath and focused as hard as he could. This time, his hand clasped the chandelier, and he felt cold metal. The solidity of it stung him like a thousand knives, but he could feel it, and that was all he needed. He teleported. 337 seconds. Aidan caught his balance on the cave floor and carefully put down the chandelier, chuffed with himself. Look what I brought you! Dimitri still lay where he had fallen, in a disturbingly unnatural position. 337 seconds. You said you'd be back in two minutes. I counted! I got you this, though, like I said. There are going to be some very confused Germans in 1934. What is it? Well, it's the chandelier I meant, Sean. Aiden looked down. The chandelier wasn't there. He hadn't been able to carry it through. Sorry, I... I must have dropped it. Bah! Chandelier! Why, why not bandages, huh? Why not food? How about some water? And prolong your suffering. Dimitri clenched his teeth in frustration. Oh, then kill me. If you can't save me, kill me! Aiden didn't reply. He wriggled his jaw uncomfortably and began to pace again. Dimitri tried to move a leg but immediately stopped, wincing. Tell me about my family then. If you've seen them through time, tell me what happens. That won't make you happy. They die young. No, it it won't make you happy to hear anything about them dying at all. You imagine those you love existing forever. It's a human ailment. It's incurable. Since when did you care about me being happy? Fine, here's what I've read. Your wife, 26 more years, cancer. Yes, she remarries. Your brother, 13 years, falls down some stairs. Splat! Then there's your daughter. Now that's a kicker. Seven years. Gwen? Yup. Gwendolyn Forrester. You two were close. You disappear. She tries to follow in your footsteps, dies out here somewhere too. Seven years. That's... I don't believe that! Aidan stopped pacing and looked down. Dimitri's eyelids drooped heavily with weariness. I'm sorry. There's, there's nothing you can do. Nothing for certain. Only little things I can try, but honestly, I don't think I can really change anything anymore. Aidan made as if to sit on the throne, but decided against it. Then something caught in his throat. The glasses weren't there anymore. Glancing around the cave, he realised many of the other trinkets he'd brought had disappeared too. Aidan ran his fingers through his hair. Dimitri realised that's what had changed about the young man's appearance. Rather than being neatly combed, Aidan's head jotted out at scruffy angles. He still looked young, but older. Do you know why I came exploring? I wanted to find something new. Something that changed everything. And here you are. And now all you want to do is go home. Typical, eh? (sighs) I can tell Gwendolyn how you died. Can't promise it'll change anything at all, but I can try. Thank you. Tell her I died quickly, and that I was happy. And I miss her, but that I wouldn't change a thing. No, I'll tell her the truth. Dimitri painfully lifted his head to frown at Aidan. What? Well, I'm not going to lie to her. I'll tell her the truth, the facts. That's what the world is built on. I'll tell her how you had an argument with your group yesterday, so you left them and went off on your own, then fell down here because you didn't tie the rope properly. No! Why? There's no need to traumatise her. Why would you say that? Better than making something up. Better than lying. 
Better than giving her some kind of untrue, unreal hope. Hope that there's anything out here to find other than death. I was wrong. You're not human at all. Bingo! Why are you even here? I thought it'd help. I thought you wouldn't want to die alone. Do you not want me here? No. Well, fine. I'll go. Never wanted to be here anyway. I can't stand it. You people and your death. You know, that's why I keep leaving. Really, I could stay as long as I'd like, but you reek. I can't stand to be around disgusting dying people. You make me sick. You're the one that said dying is fine. We all die, remember? You all die. I don't die. I can't die. I know nothing about dying. So you can lie. I've been known to make up one or two things here and there, but I don't make a habit of it. You're a monster. <laughs> monster. Serves me right for even trying. Goodbye then, Dimitri Forrester. Enjoy your final moments. Dimitri shivered feebly, caught between anger and fear. Aiden tried to teleport, but nothing happened. Exasperated, he clenched his jaw and tried again. Nothing, but he became lightheaded. The lamp by Dimitri darkened even more, its illumination now almost entirely claimed by darkness. Face growing red, Aiden inhaled sharply and twisted his whole body, his whole self, forcing every atom to shift across time and space. He lost his balance, stumbling into a table and smashing to the floor, sending a pile of papers flying across his office. He lay there for a second, shocked and angry. But it wasn't his fault. Dimitri had brought it all on himself. Aidan clambered to his feet and marched back to his desk. He skimmed through Dimitri's document to a section about Gwendolyn and read through to find her whereabouts two months after her father's disappearance. Continuing to control his breathing, Aidan stepped back from the desk and twisted into a burst of cold wind, which whisked the document from his hand. He cursed and almost dived after it, but it had already flown away. He looked up at the bustling city around him. Tall buildings shone silver with soft morning light. Hundreds of people streamed busily past Aiden on their way to work. He caught sight of a young woman among them, walking briskly as she sipped a takeaway coffee. Gwendolyn Forrester. Hi. Do I know you? I knew your father. I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Did you, uh, did you work with him? I was with him before he died. He acted recklessly, got himself trapped in a cave where he perished very slowly, despite great efforts to escape. What do you... How do you know that? It's the truth. It's... No, my father disappeared. No one knows where he is. No one knows. I know. I'm telling you. So you don't have to wonder. It was incredibly painful starvation. What was your name? Some people call me Aiden. Aiden... Who? That there wasn't an Aiden on the trip. Look, the point is, he's dead. He was foolish, it was a waste. I'm only telling you as a favour. Gwendolyn's eyes glistened. The plastic cup in her hand twisted beneath her unconsciously stiff grip. Aiden's gaze faltered in the face of her intensity. If that's true, it's what he wanted. To go somewhere no one else had, to discover something new, he'd have, he'd have been happy. He was not happy. He'd be content. What would you know? Who are you? Did you know him? Really? I knew everything about him. Then you'd know he lived the way he wanted. And it doesn't matter how it ended. That's only a tiny part. It's how he lived that mattered. And you know, an undiscovered cave? I don't think that sounds so bad. I intend to follow him. To explore. You can't go where he went. It's too dangerous. Why should I listen to you? I'm warning you not to. Well, I will anyway. Gwendolyn gave Aiden one last, incredulous look, then turned and strode back into the crowd, confident in defiance. Aiden glanced in the direction his document had flown. It'd confirm if she was telling the truth. Could be anywhere now, though. Oh. Several passers-by tossed Aiden curious glances. What? Aiden marched through the crowd and into a quiet alleyway, where he grit his teeth and returned to his office. He felt pathetic, useless. He stepped up to the window and gazed between the slits in the blinds. Brilliantly bright stars glowed beyond. Had he even changed things at all? If anything, he'd probably just made things worse. 
He looked down at his globe of the earth, resting on a small table. He brushed his fingers against it, spinning it so its features became an indistinguishable blur. He missed the days of controlling events, of filling people with awe. They used to see him as a magnificent being. He could transform their whole lives just by appearing before them. Aidan's thoughts were interrupted by his fax machine, which, towards the other side of the room, spontaneously whirred to life, chirping excitedly as it printed new documents, new jobs, new tragedies for him to resolve. But what could he do? What power did he have left? All he could do was talk to people, and that never worked the way he intended. No, he had no plan. No capacity to help people the way he once could just an eternity of time to kill. The mechanical chugging of the fax machine rang loud in his ears. It would just go on and on and on. Aidan marched to the farthest corner of the room, fell into a cross-legged seat, pressed his fingers into his ears, and began to count to ten million. Miracle Man by Thomas Medina Read by Carly Milroy Performed by Jacob Mation Laurie Fielders And Isabel Amy Music composed by Thomas Field The story continues in Conductor of Earth. Find out more at conductorofearth.com